The Balsetis Lab and other labs have looked at whether or not people make progress toward goals of different types, whether or not they're thinking about the goal, they're thinking about that goal line and what they want to achieve, that long-term goal and all the wonderful things associated with it, or whether or not they're thinking about all the ways in which they could fail and route to that goal. This is not typically what we are encouraged to do. Typically, we are told, don't imagine failure, push failure out of your mind, only focus on success, you know, fake it till you make it, or is a phrase that I absolutely hate, uh, frankly, because it's not even clear what that means. And it's not even clear what the ethical form of that is. I think it means continue despite any anxiety or fear that things won't work out. But if you look at the scientific literature, what the Balsetis Lab and other labs have shown is that there's a near doubling, near doubling the probability of reaching one's goal if you focus routinely on foreshadowing failure. You think about the ways in which things could fail if you take action A or you take action B and instead, therefore, you take action C. You're supposed to think about how things could fail if you don't get up and run each morning if your goal is, say, a fitness goal. So let's use that as an example because even though I realize people are in pursuit of many things, not just fitness, fitness goals and physical goals are a very concrete thing that we can all get on the same page about. Let's say somebody sets a goal of running five miles four times a week minimum and as many as seven, four times a week minimum before 8 a.m. Okay, in a previous podcast on habits, I talked about the benefits of not necessarily setting specific times that one will do things, but setting time blocks that one will do things. So you say before 8 a.m., you're gonna run five miles and that's gonna happen up to seven days a week. One version of this would be, okay, sit back in a chair and think about how great you're going to feel and look if you're doing this every day, how your health is going to improve, how everything's going to, your blood markers of lipids, et cetera, are going to improve. Okay, fine. That's the visualization goal of visualizing the end point. Turns out that is far less effective and maybe even counterproductive compared to thinking about what's going to happen if you don't do this the negative health outcomes that are going to occur, the disappointment you're going to have in yourself, the fact that you're going to wait until 7.30, that's not long enough for many people to run five miles. You go to put it on your shoes, it's going to be pouring rain or even hailing or snowing outside. And now you're not going outside unless you're somebody who's particularly motivated to do that. Okay, so foreshadowing failure turns out to be the best way to motivate toward goal pursuit. In fact, as I mentioned before, there's a near doubling in the likelihood that people will reach goals of any kind when they're constantly thinking about how bad it's going to be if they fail. Gabrielle Utengen in my department has identified a third often overlooked or underappreciated stage that has to happen in the goal setting process. And that's thinking about the obstacles that stand in your way of success. And that it will actually help improve motivation in the long run. And sometimes people think that that is counterintuitive. You're saying like, if I want to increase my motivation, have more motivation, then I need to think about how hard it's going to be, all the ways that I'm going to fail. How is that going to like jazz me up? How is that going to help me get through when things get hard? But it does because it's like coming up with a plan B, a plan C, plan D in advance of actually experiencing that. If you were on a boat and the boat started to sink, that's not the time you want to start looking for life jackets. You already want to know where one is so you can go to it right away. And it's the same thing with goal setting is that you want to know what am I working towards? How am I going to get there? And if I experience this obstacle, here's what I'm going to do about it. You may never experience that obstacle, but if you do, you're probably going to be shy on time, thin on resources, maybe experiencing an anxiety that hijacks your brain. So you're not functioning at that optimal level of judgment and decision making. You want to already have the snap next step in place so you can just hop to it. Right? We're not going to do our best thinking when we're in crisis mode, but we don't have to if we have already used our resources in advance to come up with that plan B or that plan C. If we think back to the neural circuit associated with assessing value in our goal pursuits, this makes perfect sense. The amygdala, that center of the brain that's involved in anxiety and fear and worry, well, the amygdala is one of the four core components of our goal setting and goal pursuit circuitry. And there's no bypassing that. There is no one listening to this or watching this whose amygdala is not involved in their goal setting and goal pursuit behavior. And so while I'd love to be able to tell you that all you should think about is rainbows and puppies and all the wonderful rewarding things that are going to happen when you achieve your goals, the truth is you should be thinking mainly about how bad it's really going to get if you don't do it, how disappointing yourself you're going to feel, how it will negatively impact you, if not in the immediate term, in the long term, if indeed your goal is to reach your goal. So I want to emphasize that I'm not interested in encouraging people to flagellate themselves. I'm encouraging people to achieve their goals. And it turns out the best way to do that is by foreshadowing failure. And the more specific you can get, 
by writing down or thinking about or talking about how bad it will be if you don't achieve your goals, the more likely you are to achieve those goals. Part of the reason for that almost certainly has to do with increases in systolic blood pressure and increases in readiness in your system when you imagine failure. The brain and body are much better at moving away from fearful things than towards things we want. I wish I could tell you that wasn't the case, but there is a true asymmetry in the way we are built. In fact, the brain and body can engage in what's called one trial learning. When something bad happens, we eat a food that makes us sick. We have an interaction with a person or place that we really don't like. It only takes one trial, one event, one time to reorient or rewire our neural circuitry so that we have a bias toward moving away from that thing in the future. When things go well, unfortunately, that doesn't often occur. If things go really, really well, it might orient our brain and body toward wanting more of that thing and we'll have neural circuitry changes that will lead us to engage in that particular behavior or interaction again. But it is never as effective as these avoidance circuits. So again, foreshadow failure. If you're going to visualize in a positive way, do that at the very beginning of some goal pursuit, maybe intermittently every once in a while, you imagine the big win of, you know, scoring perfect on an exam or winning the championship or the great relationship. But most of the time, if you want to be effective, you should be focusing on avoiding failure and you should be really clear about what those failures would look like and feel like. Michael Phelps, like incredible athlete, right? This is something that he and his coach have routinely incorporated into their training. I love this story that back in 2008, he was hot for the first time on the international stage It was the Beijing Olympics. Michael Phelps was on the brink of doing something that no one else in the history of the Olympic Games has ever done, which is win eight gold medals in a single Olympiad. At the time of this story, he had already won seven and he had just the 200 fly in front of him before he could do what no one else has ever done, win the eighth gold medal. And the fly is his thing. This should have been easy, like a no brainer. He's going to win this. He's going to break Olympic history. As soon as he dove into the pool, his goggles started to leak. And by the time he had done three lengths of the pool, he just had to flip around and and come back to the starting line slash finish line, back to the edge. By the time that happened, his goggles were completely filled with water and he was swimming blind. I would have panicked. I would have sunk to the bottom of the pool. I wouldn't have even been in the pool, to be honest. Like, I'm not a swimmer. Definitely not going to be in the Olympics. But for him, he didn't. It wasn't a moment of panic. Like, it probably would have been for nearly every other person in that situation because he had foreshadowed that kind of possible failure. He had imagined that obstacle hitting him in advance and not even just imagined it, but practiced it. What will we do? He routinely practiced swimming with his goggles, not fully secured on his face. His coach notoriously would rip the goggles off of his head, smash them on the ground for maybe dramatic effect or something so that he didn't even have any goggles possible to grab as he's in practice. So because he had foreshadowed that possibility and the solution, if my goggles start to leak, then I will do, in his case, start counting my strokes, then I'll make it through. He knew exactly how many strokes it would take from him to get from one end of the pool to the other. He started counting his strokes. He won that race, the 200 fly, won his eighth gold medal, and he'd go on to win 15 more in his career. So we might not all be swimmers. We might not all aspire to Olympic level performance. But I love that example because I think it helps sort of demystify or give us an alternative perspective on the importance and the motivational reasons why thinking about obstacles in advance, thinking about the ways, the two, three, four ways that your plan might go awry is actually effective at helping us to overcome the obstacle that might otherwise lead us to throw in the towel. If we constantly place ourselves into a mode of thinking that we are failing, well, then indeed, we are not going to churn out much dopamine. Now, earlier I said we need to predict and visualize failure, but that is not the same thing as thinking about ourselves as failing. We need to predict what the outcome would be if we failed, but then encountering that and in behaving in a certain way and thinking in a certain way and pursuing our goals in an effective way, maybe checking in on that each week, we definitely need to reward ourselves cognitively for the correct and successful pursuit. What this means is that anticipate and think about failure as a mechanism of generating motivation and indeed fear and anxiety so that you lean into the correct behaviors and you lean away from the incorrect behaviors to reach your goal. But then weekly or so, whatever you can maintain consistently, you absolutely want to reward yourself cognitively by telling yourself, I'm on the right track. I got another week where I accomplished whatever it is that I'm trying to accomplish. 